Hey, everybody, and welcome to Healthy Living. I'm Chef AJ, and I don't have just one fabulous guest tonight. I have two. I have Tanai Suzuki and the vegan vet, Our Mighty May. And we're going to go a half hour first with Tanai and talk about her new book, Healthy Happy Pooch. And then we're going to talk to Dr. May about the efficacy of having a plant-based diet for your pet, specifically for a dog. So I'm going to first introduce Tanai Suzuki. She is a box flower registered practitioner and plant-based whole health macrobiotic nutrition counselor for people and pets. She's the author of two cookbooks and her new book, Healthy Happy Pooch, was just published this month. Her passion for learning about alternative holistic medicine and plant-based macrobiotic nutrition began when she was diagnosed with ovarian cancer in 1993. The illness challenged her to think about the relationship between her lifestyle, attitude, and food choices to her physical, emotional, and spiritual state. And she considered the impact of one on the other, and she recovered from this very serious cancer. So welcome, Sanai, and welcome, our mighty. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. Hi. So, so you have this book that, to me, is just such a wonderful resource for any pet owner, any dog owner, or I hate that word owner, dog guardian, a companion animal friend. And I wish this resource had existed before, but it, it's so – how where did you get the idea to put all this in a book? Because it really is so comprehensive, everything we need to do to have a healthy, happy pooch. Well, um, how did I start to put the book? Because people – asked me what I do for my dogs, even just going to the walking dogs, and they look at my dogs, wow, they look so good, healthy, or one of the oldest dogs, Kura, she's 12, and, you know, people always ask, how old is she? And I say, she's 12, and then they say, she look like a seven, you know? So yeah, I- anyway, that's like uh, more and more people asked. I said, um... Okay, I need to put together instead of emailing each person each time, and it takes <laughs> yeah too many too too much time for me to spend. As so I said, I, I just need to put together so that I can just tell them that I put all the information that I use, and so it took it took quite a while, but uh, I'm I'm very happy that I, it finished and then it's out there. Yeah, it's a beautiful book. Why don't you tell our listeners how many pets you actually have? Because you have eight times more than I do. <laughs> <laughs> well, right now uh, I I maximize. So I have six dogs and two cats, wow. and I always say one husband. <laughs> uh, well, together, you, that's nine. So you actually have enough for a baseball team, actually. <laughs> So. Yeah, that's true. Yes, but I I usually have um, maybe two or three dogs and then two cats, and then I keep the same number of my husband. But uh, this time it's uh, just happened to be six dogs. Yes. Yeah. And I, I think I hear a few of them in the background, actually. Yeah, exactly, because I was supposed to feed them, and then um, work got in, involved, and uh, they're waiting. So uh, if the time, they know the time, what time they eat, and if I don't feed, they are actually, okay, come on, come on. Oh, boy. Yeah, be on, uh, come on. <laughs> No barking, guys. I've been to your house, and I've met all of them, and they are absolutely lovely. Can we tell everybody who your husband is? Is that all right? Yes, of course. Yes. Yeah. So Sanai is married to, to my being the best plant-based chef, out, Chef Eric LeChasseur, and they both own this most wonderful vegan restaurant in Venice called Seed Kitchen. And it's almost like Sanai, like you're the chef to all these dogs, the way Eric is to all the movie stars. <laughs> That's right, exactly. I I always say that I don't cook for the rich people or famous people, but I cook for my dogs. I'm the private chef for my dogs, yes, exactly. You know, when I look at the recipes in your book, I mean, I would eat them. That's how good they look to me, you know, the lentils and the beans and the and the quinoa. I mean, these are all things that I eat. Yes, exactly. Uh, I taste all the dog food, that the commercial dog food for the, my dogs, that if they want to try. So, of course, I tried their food, too, and they taste delicious. 
if you taste all the food that I make for them, it's really good taste. It's not just healthy, it's delicious for even people. Right. Yes. That, that, that's, you know what I love about your book is, you know, I wrote a book a few years ago called Unprocessed because my belief is, I mean, of course, I'd like everyone to be vegan, but even if somebody isn't vegan, I don't believe they should be eating processed food. And, you know, we could say the same for our pets because when you think about it, there's only three species in the entire world that have ever been overweight or obese, humans, domesticated dogs, and domesticated cats. And I believe it's because they're not eating their natural diet. They're eating processed food. And I love the idea of just cooking for our dogs the way we would for ourselves and not feeding them the, the fast food version of, of pet food, you know? Exactly. I totally agree that the processed food is, you know, as you already wrote a book about the unprocessed. So processed food is the, the, one of the worst things that I can think, and it goes to the pets too, definitely. And uh, uh, they, they thrive with the whole plant-based food, and uh, um, this this book, as you read, uh, for the transitioning for the b beginning, that some people want to still uh, give the meat, I said that's fine, you know, but I want them to give, like, organic meat and things like that for transitioning, or the people who truly not want to uh, do the 100% plant-based. I, I totally understand it, too. You know, I'm not here to judge anybody. Mm -hmm. I'm here to just to, uh, introduce that the healthy food for what uh, uh, pets deserve to eat, you know? Sure. Now, you know, uh, Dr. May is going to talk about this in more detail, but I'm going to have, I'm going to run this question by you because while we were waiting for you guys to be on the line, one of the listeners said, well, you know, dogs, they're, they're, they came from wolves and they're not natural vegans. So mm -hmm. uh, wh how can we say that our dogs should be vegan and aren't they going to be missing some kind of supplements? How would you address that? And of course, Dr. May is going to address that when she comes on the line. Yeah, I'm sure Dr. May will uh, give a much better scientific explanation, but uh, my e experience, okay, I had the same uh, thinking. So originally when I started cooking for my dogs, I had 30% organic meat and 70% was total plant-based. That's what I did because I wasn't really sure. And... Uh, they did, of course, good, much better than the processed food. But as I was doing that for 10 years or so, and then uh, when I had a new dog, I said, okay, I really want to try that 100% uh, plant-based uh, food for the new dog. And I did for the new new dog, uh, actually, too, just uh, they, they were like uh, about, I would say, four or five weeks old. And I started trying, and what I found was uh, amazingly that uh, um, different than the, what I expected. S once in a while, that the, the dog who had um, uh, organic meat, they had kind of like a diarrhea or like a soft bowel movement. Okay, but the, the plant, 100% plant-based. Uh, dog, the two new one, they did not have it. And it happened like a few times after that. Then I and my husband said, let's do everybody 100% plant-based diet. And mm -hmm. that's what we did. And after that, we never really had any problem. So it's from the experience. And of course, what you're saying is correct. Like, if they are in the wild, they pretty much eat anything because they are omnivore, you know. Mm -hmm. But how much, can you imagine how much they can eat, like uh, chicken or uh, beef or pork? Um, how much they going to attack and they're going to hunt? You know what I mean? Right. right. So in the wild, even that the human, too, that they talk about, uh, human were eating meat. Yes, that's true. But how often that American Indian were able to get hunt the buffalo meat? That's right. 
once in a while, you know, to me, like eating like every day breakfast, lunch, and dinner, meat and meat and meat. Right, they weren't. Me, they weren't that's they weren't. unnatural, you absolutely, know? Absolutely, absolutely. You know what's great about this book? Even if somebody didn't have a dog, I would recommend it because you have recipes for homemade household cleaners that are safe for your dog, but they're great for people like a lavender liquid hand soap, a, a, a counter cleaner, a glass cleaner. A toilet bowl cleaner. I mean, I think it's worth it just to get the carpet cleaner, it, just to get these natural remedies, fly spray that's not going to kill them. I mean, this is pretty cool that you, how did you develop all of these non-toxic recipes? Oh, well, thank you. Yes. Uh, well, the first was because of, um, I used to live in a, a typical American apartment with the carpet, right? Mm-hmm. And I was a uh, I had to vacuum or I had to buy the regular carpet cleaners. I hated those smells, okay? And then I noticed that especially the cats because they lick the, their paws all the time and then they get sick. I could tell maybe it could be from the carpet cleaners. So that was at the beginning, the smells and also protecting the cat. Now, it wasn't maybe it was a dog in the beginning. But then when I started making those, I noticed the cat did not have a problem. And then also I enjoyed the smells. And so that was the beginning. So that was like over 20 years ago I just started making it. And then I hear that sometimes that uh, um, crazy story about Dogs eating good food, but they had a liver problem. And I start thinking about where the dogs getting this liver problem. And I, this is my imagination, but I thought that they are always on the floor, right? Mm-hmm. So if you are using chemical cleaner for uh, clean the, your wood floor or carpet again, uh, they are consuming that this chemical all the time and then laying down. So I said that this is really dangerous for them. Okay. Can you imagine that, that you you wash the, your sheets or towel, chemical soap, and you using that every night and sleep in? I mean, sure. th- this is really bad uh, for your liver and kidney uh, functioning. Right, because so, they, 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 the dogs absorb everything through their pads. So, like, if you clean with, like, pine salt, they can absorb those toxins through their paws. Oh, yes. Pine salt is really uh, bad, too. Yes. You can yeah. make your own, uh, your car uh, smell nice stuff, you know. Uh, you can make it. Like, uh, the recipe that I I share in a book it's just a part of the, what I do, and I thought that maybe that could be very useful. I already got um, somebody email me. She was a skeptical, but she used a flea, flea um, spray, and she said that it really worked for her dog, and uh, she was very happy, and she sent me the email to say thank you, you know? Wonderful. You know, even if somebody didn't want to go 100% plant-based, you have recipes in the book for those sweet potato chewy things that are so expensive when you buy them, and you have a recipe for that in your book. Yes, exactly. Right. And then when you make a homemade uh, food or treat, it's less expense. So you are saving money, definitely, yes. You know, can you imagine that if I have, you know, buying that the uh, commercial food for six dogs and two cats. Yeah, that, uh, oh wow! I'm, I'm gonna be broke. <laughs> you know what else I love in your book is you have these cartoons peppered throughout, and the one that I love the most is a photograph of two dogs sitting at a restaurant dining. You know, wearing like tux, like like oh, the ones wearing a dress and ones wearing a suit, and the dog waiter comes over and he says, 
sparkling tap or toilet. I thought that was hilarious. That was oh, thank you. Yes, Dave is the one, and uh, uh, he he's the cartoonist. I I found him and I talked to him, and then he really loved my book, and then he allowed me to have his uh, cartoon in my book. But they make a very special part of that in my book, and it makes you smile and laugh. Yeah. Really, you know the the one that I liked the first one was like a dog is looking at you, uh, the owner of the dog that holding this canned food, right? And he says, uh, uh, "If you really think this is a safe, it would take a bite." You know, I'm looking at that one right now. It's adorable. These are just so you can get it just for the cartoons. They're sort of like the cartoons in New York, or they're they're so adorable. Hey, exactly, tonight- and the perfect for my book. Yeah. Yes. Perfect. Are there, even in the plant-based world, are there any foods that we should not be feeding our dogs? Now, I know chocolate and I know onions, but anything else that we should be aware of? Yes, like uh, grapes are not good. Mm -hmm. A lot of people think fruits are good and the grapes are tasty for us. So the grapes that uh, people maybe may not know, or avocado. Yeah. Okay. Things like that. They are all list in my books. Mm-hmm. Most of, I think I cover most of, most of the food, and then also uh, all the plants around us. Uh, some of them are very dangerous for dogs. Mm-hmm. So I cover as much as I could think. Yes. I, I always heard that it's it's very unsafe, like at Christmas, for dogs to eat poinsettia plants. That's right, yes. All those plants are not good. It looks nice, and it's a seasonal, of course. Or like amaryllis, you know, that the red uh, looks like a lily. Yeah. Okay, beautiful. Those are also very dangerous, too. So Mm -hmm. you've got to be very careful that, you know, what they're eating. Some, of course, uh, it's okay for them to eat uh, dandelion that I grow in my garden, they love the dandelion greens, and uh, also uh, what else I grow? Uh, carrots. Oh, carrots I cannot grow uh, near them because they pull whole thing and they eat entire my garden. <laughs> That's funny. Yeah, right? they eat uh, uh, carrots top and root orange part, everything, yes. You know, in addition to addressing the food and why it's important to feed your dogs healthy food instead of processed food, homemade food, you talk about other subjects that I personally am really into, both for myself and my pets, such as black box flower remedies, massage, acupuncture, Reiki. So talk a little bit about that and why these are so beneficial for dogs as they are for humans as well. Okay, sure, of course. Well, Black flower is uh, applying to them uh, mainly the emotional factors. They live with us. And uh, do we have a stressful life? Many people are. So they do mirroring our emotional issue as much as a physical issue. And then even though they do eat good food, emotional factor needs to be taken care of. And uh, black flower has a vibrational energy. And that will help you, to, and then change the megahertz. Okay, and then some people may not be, um, how do you say, the familiar with uh, all those things. But let's say that um, some people drink too much coffee and they get really hyper. That means their megahertz is going whack, whack. You know, like it's not the balancing. So let's say that taking the uh, back flower. Let's say if you taking coffee, then I'll say the rescue remedy, or maybe something that the walnuts would mean something uh, helped environment because you drunk something and you feeling some surrounding. Then if you when you take all these, uh, they will just give you the vibration, the calming vibration, and they help you to calm. So the dogs. First time when you adopt a dog, and they're happy that you, they get adopted, but they don't know you, and you don't know them. So you guys are both a uh, little nervous. 
Definitely. Then if you take a little bit of the rescue remedy, that will just help to calm down, and then it will be able to accepting in that the new environment. And all those things are very, very beneficial. And as much as massaging is really good, and then acupuncture and Reiki, you know, most of plant-based people, they, they do... Uh, uh, check all those uh, holistic uh, healing, uh, uh, which, what should I say, the sources that, uh, you know. So dogs can get benefit as much as uh, people too, definitely, yes. Mm-hmm. That's amazing. And, you know, one of the things you address in the book, if you'd like to talk a little bit about, you also gave a, lec- uh, a class on this on the Holistic Holiday Speak cr- Cruise, is grieving. That's something that, that a lot of people don't really know how to do for our pets because, you know, a lot of times your dog dies and people go, oh, well, it's just a dog. Well, hello, it's, it's a family member, you know. I think it's sometimes right. harder to lose a dog than, than, than a real family, not a real family, you know what I mean, than a human family member. Yes, exactly. Like I myself, I'm with my dogs much longer than even I'm spending time with my husband, okay? Mm-hmm. So when I go away, that the first thing that the, I, I ask my husband is not how are you. I say, how are they doing, you know? It's like <laughs> to me, I'm close to them uh, emotionally because I spend the time with them so much. So uh, when you're losing uh, your loved ones, not just to the, the people, but the dogs, like for me, is really a uh, challenge. And the grieving is the part of the process and acceptance and uh, to understand that, the, you know, they, they went to the next level, okay? But helping this grieving, taking uh, uh back flower remedy, again, another emotional level, the vibration helps. And there is also another uh, homeopath medicine helps, but uh, back flower is really important. And I'm not saying that uh, ignore or forget about your dogs. You can't, but just accepting uh, that you are sad. I mean, I still think about a couple of dogs that I lost or they die uh, because of the, their age. And um, one of the cats was 20 years old. She lived a long life, but I still think about her. And when that feeling comes, I just do uh, accept that feeling, oh, yeah, I am thinking about her, and I miss her definitely. I miss her existence, and instead of that, the denial of why I'm, you know, still thinking about her, instead of that, just enjoy the memories, and then if you, if you're not able to, like, uh, sleep because thinking about too much in the beginning of the grieving process, it's good to take uh, back flower remedy, let's say, uh, honeysuckle, that is a good, that's something that uh, you think of memory the, or the way that the, when you had uh, your dog or cat, and that helps. That doesn't mean that you're not going to think about them or you forget about their memory. It's just like a, a smoothing out and then feeling uh, okay, like, yeah, I am missing her. I am missing him. And uh, you can also start taking all this uh, when your dog is getting older or when your dog or cat is getting older and getting sick and you are very concerned, not only the dogs, you take these back flowers and then you're able to actually work through with them instead of like um, stressed out and not able to let them go. My experience of them going um, to the next uh, chapter, which I talked uh, on the uh, lecture, uh, going to the Rainbow Bridge. You know Rainbow Bridge? Yeah, you have that poem in your book. It's a lovely poem. 
Yes, thank you. Yes, when I first time uh, I had a dog in this country, and uh, when she passed, I was so grieved, you know, just not even grieving. I was just freaking out and didn't know what to do. And somebody gave me the poem, and then it helped me to see the, oh, yeah, there is a rainbow bridge, and I'm going to see her later, you know. So um, I think it's important for us to uh, help us and help uh, your dogs and cats that if they are deciding to leave, my experience was one of the dogs that I adopted, that she was so old and uh, a doctor said, a veterinarian doctor said that uh, she's not going to last this month. That was November or December, the winter. But she ended up staying with me three years. Wow. Okay. Yes, exactly. She had no fur when I found her, and she was limping. So she walked with three legs, and she was deaf and blind. Wow. And Yes, but she lived with me three years, and then I was going through very hard time. I think that was the beginning of that uh, when I had uh, my ovarian cancer that I didn't even know I was having, but I was uh, feeling really uh, tired and get, getting sick all the time. So she couldn't leave, and one day I had to talk to her face to face. That I talk about in the communication section in the book. You really need to talk to your uh, cats or dog, and they mm-hmm. really understand. And I had to tell her, you know, you you've been so good for with me three years, and I'm so happy for you. And I know you worry about me, but I'm okay. And if you need to go, you, you know, just go. And I'm I'm okay. And next morning she left. Wow. It was it was amazing because doctor said that she's going to go any time. Uh, but her heart was strong. She, everything else was not working. But her heart was functioning. And uh, But I just had to tell her, it's okay. And then she looked at me like, okay, mommy, I think, you know, you're telling me this. Uh, I think I understand. And next morning when she went, of course, I was very sad, but uh, I felt that she got my message, and she had to go. I I couldn't let her stay here in that condition, you know? Yep, yep, I do. Well, you say that it's important to talk to your pets. I talk to my dog all day long, but she has never once answered. <laughs> Well, that's you to really understand what they saying, and uh, you can communicate. Maybe uh, be quiet and then listen to them. I think, uh, uh, yeah, you understand. You you talking to? Them. Do you know how many uh, words they understand? Dogs, for instance. I don't know, seven hundred. Oh wow, you're so idealistic. Uh, it's about 250 that's what I heard from a dog trainer but yeah but we tend to tell them only their name or come or no you know not not 250 words so you can talk to them and tell them clearly, not just uh, like whining things, but you can tell them, I want to talk to you. I really think you're great. See, giving them acknowledgement, compliment, that is really good for them. Same as a human, you know? Sure. And appreciation. And uh, so if your dog is having uh, some kind of issue with you, uh, maybe barking too much or whatever, then you need to talk to them also and give that uh, uh, maybe Heather in the back flower, that's uh, some dog to talk too much. The Heather is very good. And all those things are combination. Then maybe you massage them and then 
you go to a massage uh, someplace that, uh, and then you get to relax too, same time, right? You do for them, but you do for yourself, right? Hey, have you, absolutely. Have you ever been to like either a pet psychic or an animal communicator? Yes, I've been to, yes. And I'm actually uh, just start studying uh, animal communication with uh, uh, one of the teachers here in Los Angeles. Yes. Yeah, I, I love that because I do. I take my dog. I, I might actually interview the one I know, Lydia Hibby, on this show because I, I find that so fascinating, and I've, I've been studying that at that as well. So where do people huh. buy this wonderful book, Sanai? Do you have a website for Happy Healthy Pooch, or can they get it on Amazon or the bookstore? Or Yes. Well, you can get it through website Healthy Happy Pooch dot com. If you want, especially the autograph uh, copy, that's the way to do. And Amazon definitely. And a couple of shops that are gonna start carrying. Maybe Healthy Spot. I'm talking to the owner of Healthy Spot right now, and what? they are really open to promoting more healthier for the pets. And so I'm very excited. Uh, I'm hoping that I'm going to get a meeting with them next month. That's fantastic. Now, yes. with, you, with you feeding your dogs all this wonderful food, when you take them out, do they still try to eat, like, you know, squirrel poop and stuff? Or, or is, that, is that just a dog thing, or is that, like, showing that they're not really eating a very good diet? Uh, well, I haven't seen that they're eating uh, uh, squirrel poo, but... I've seen that they're eating, um, let's say, that the deer mm-hmm. poo when we go to the mountain. Mm-hmm. And uh, another thing they love to eat uh, is bamboo leaves in our garden. Interesting. Yeah, and the other day uh, they were eating uh, uh, raspberry leaves in the garden. Huh. Okay, things like that. So I notice more they're eating, chewing, uh, um, uh, plant-based stuff. But maybe I, they they're hiding the behind my back. They they eating a squirrel poo and things like that. <laughs> Who yeah. knows? You know? Yeah. Wow. Now I know that you do consults for people. You're a macrobiotic counsel counselor. Do you ever do them for dogs as well? Yes, I do. Right now, uh, one other person in, in Belgium. Uh, she got a new dog, and uh, her friend bought my book. So I'm uh, counseling on the Skype. So I do counseling people and pets all over the world, and uh, on the phone or Skype or email, or if you happen to be, you know, living here, of course I see. Uh, especially dog, if I can see them. Uh, uh, in person or in dog, that's a better. And another dog that she just had a stomach cancer, and uh, he's doing really, really good. And then he's getting uh, um, nutrition, uh, uh, medical uh, supplement from the holistic doctor uh, that I recommend, and he's doing really good. So I'm very happy. But, uh, um, you know, he changed the diet, and it's good that he lost the weight. He was overweight, mm-hmm. and this dog happened to love everything that he eats, so there was no problem. But I heard um, uh, quite a few dogs, especially cats, too, uh, in the beginning, they go hunger strike, you know, and they know that the uh, owner is going to worry to death if they don't eat the food maybe two days, you know? Mm-hmm. But I I would say that if they're really hungry, and they, as long as they're drinking water, um, don't worry about it, you know? I mean, they will eat eventually. Or another thing I said that in the book, uh, if the dog don't want to eat this food, then you just need to add maybe even teaspoon or one tablespoon of this uh, plant-based food diet into the, what they've been eating. Just sure. adding, just a taste, okay, a little bit. Right. Okay, not a big. It's a slow process to some of the dogs and cats. 
Sure, okay? sure, sure. Well, yeah, every, I, everybody's I, a different, right? Absolutely. And same thing with kids. If they're not eating vegetables, don't just feed them two pounds of vegetables. Start with a little bit each day and, and work up to it. This right. Book is wonderful. I thank you so much for writing it. I know that you're such a dog lover because you met my new rescue dog, Bailey, on Sunday, and she just took to you like she knew you forever. She just loved you so much. Oh, I loved her. I, I really wanted to spend time more with her, but uh, she left, so I was, oh, no, she left. But well, you know, I, I'm little... looking forward to seeing You guys will yeah. have to come over. That that would be so great. Well, Sanai, thank you so much, and I want to get Dr. May on the line so that she can tell our listeners why it's okay to use the recipes in this wonderful book and why we can feed our dogs homemade food and plant-based food. And please feel free to stay on the line as well, okay? Yes, I will. Thank you so much, Chef AJ, and thank you for the, your great endorsement for the book. My thank pleasure. you. Well, it's a great book, and thank you that we're talking to Sanai Suzuki about her new book, Healthy Happy Pooch. And now coming to join us is Dr. Armighty May. She oh. is... A, hi, our, hi. Like, let me read your wonderful bio, and then we'll start talking about everything we just started with tonight. Dr. Armighty May, veterinarian, is a house call veterinarian for dogs and cats. She currently practices in the West L.A. area. Armighty went vegan and became an animal advocate while an undergraduate student at UC Berkeley, where she graduated with a B.S. in behavioral sciences in 2001. She obtained her Doctor of Veterinary Medicine degree from the University of California Davis School of Veterinary Medicine, wonderful, in June of 2005. And after graduating from veterinary school, Dr. May spent 20 months working at a 24-hour emergency dog and cat hospital. She then became certified in veterinary acupuncture through the Qi Institute of Chinese Medicine. Dr. May is an avid supporter of educational vegan outreach and humane education programs, and she has 63 episodes of her internet radio show called Animal Issues with Dr. Armighty May, which can be heard at veganvet.net slash podcast episode. So please welcome Dr. May. How you doing? Oh, fine. Thanks for having me. By the way, my uh, degree at Berkeley was bioresource sciences, not behavioral oh, sciences. Sorry. I, I, you know, I was just re Oh, you know what? I, okay. <laughs> this is not my husband's. This is me because I Although I did I, take a course in animal behavior, so. I'm sorry about that. I, I have know a couple things. <laughs> you know, it actually does say that, but because I am too uh, vain to wear glasses, I, I <laughs> So sorry about that. No so, worries. And it's so cool that you're, you know, you're a vegan vet and you're, you're a vet who's a vegan and you, you advocate this way of eating. But you know what other people say because, you know, there's people out there, Dr. May, that don't even think that people should be vegan. And when we mm -hmm. start talking about animals being vegan, they're like, it's not natural, you know. Mm -hmm. So, please, you know, that's what everybody wants to know. So I know that, you know, you would never do anything to harm an animal. Mm -hmm. So why is it okay for us to feed our pets if we choose, you know, let's talk about dogs specifically i don't know if cats sure. have the same criterion is it okay to feed them a vegan diet to make or your own food or is it just like nope if they were out there they'd be eating it so let's give them meat so it's a often commonly asked question that why could dogs be vegan and they certainly can be as long as the nutrient requirements they have are met and that can be met through plant and mineral sources uh, they don't have ingredient requirements like the specific kind of meat they have to have in order to survive. So they have amino acid requirements, which are nutrients, and they can find those nutrients from plant-based foods. So they biologically are omnivores, but as long as their nutritional requirements are met, then a vegan diet can be perfectly acceptable. And in fact, there's actually a really interesting study uh, that was done just a few years ago, uh, published in Journal of Nature, which found that dogs actually have genes for digesting starches, which set them apart from their carnivore cousins, the wolves. A lot of times people will assume that dogs and wolves should have the same type of diet, and they look at what wolves eat in the wild, and then they figure, well, we should just feed dogs that. But the fact of the matter is that dogs have been domesticated for well over 10,000 years. Uh, some records show it as far back as 30,000 years ago, uh, Iberia, and maybe as, as recently as 11,000 years ago in Israel, showing DNA studies of modern dogs, uh, putting them at domestication 
well over 10,000 years ago. So during this time when they, they have been domesticated, they have developed the ability to digest carbohydrates, which definitely uh, has put them in a position to digest plant starches, potatoes, corn, <laughs> rice, beans, all these uh, nutritious foods that have the protein and uh, the nutrients they need. Now, granted, it is important that it be a balanced diet, and it, uh, if people don't have time to make the home-cooked foods that Sanai is uh, suggesting in her book, which is you know fantastic if people do have the time, then there are also commercially available plant-based options which meet the dog's nutritional requirements. As long as the food is what's called AFCO approved, which is the association, American Association of Feed Control Officials, mm -hmm. uh, then it, it meets those criteria. And there are a number of brands, V-Dog being one of them, uh, sure. that definitely meet those criteria. And we love V Dog because that's Linda Middlesworth. That's a, that's another um, wonderful vegan that that really helps a lot of animals and people as well. So we love supporting her and her company. Yes, definitely. Yeah. So so like you know I, I was at the pet store today because somebody gave me I just adopted this new dog so I got a gift card and I went and bought her a Halloween costume and uh, I'm not sure that you know dressing her up is the best thing but you know it's once a year so and I notice now there's a trend and there's a trend in humans grain free grain free you know like everything mm -hmm. like well human you know is this just a craze like it is with people because we know that whole grains I'm not talking about processed flours but whole grains mm -hmm. are some of the healthiest things we can eat you know and now yeah everybody's saying grains are bad and are are they really that bad for pets too that I I I don't think so I think it, it is a fad uh, just as we're seeing a lot of gluten-free advertisements and packaging and not that gluten-free is bad for humans I think it's important for certain people to be mindful of not consuming gluten but I think for the vast majority of people whole grains you know including whole wheat are n nutritious foods that, that are fine to consume unless they have an actual allergy mm -hmm. to the gluten. Uh, so similarly, you know, there may be a small minority of dogs that have sensitivities to specific grains, be it rice or corn or wheat, but the vast majority of them are going to handle digestion of those grains just fine. Mm -hmm. And actually, what I've found in my clinical practice is a lot of dogs who develop skin allergies, who have itching, biting, scratching, licking, can be sometimes from allergies to meat protein, including chicken and beef. Interesting. So, yeah, so in those cases, uh, putting these dogs on a vegetarian or vegan diet actually improves the skin coat in a dramatic way. In fact, for dogs that have these types of issues, assuming flea control has already been dealt with and there aren't other external factors that are contributing to the allergy problem, I will often recommend an eight-week food elimination trial on a vegan diet for these dogs so we can actually see if they get better. And I've, I've um, encountered a number of cases that have definitely improved from being on the vegan food. Wow, that's interesting. So one of one of the listeners uh, wrote in a question, which was to the effect of just because we can do something doesn't mean we should. And what they were trying to say is that, yes, a dog could – theoretically be vegan but they like meat so why should we not if, if they love it like if you were to put your dog down and you know offer them some meat and offer them some carrots there's a good chance that many of the dogs would choose the meat and since they like it wouldn't it be mean to withhold it from them well that's an interesting question because when we talk about what someone likes whether it's a kid who likes ice cream or someone who likes smoking cigarettes or <laughs> someone likes to go to the rodeo and see animals being abused. Just because someone likes engaging in an activity doesn't mean that that person or animal should engage in that activity. Right, right. And dogs are, are pets, are family members. We are their guardians. I like the word guardian that you used earlier to yeah. denote uh, the caretaker role that we fill. And so, yeah, you know, if you left the garbage open, your dog probably would love to leap in there and, and have a party and probably get very sick and end up needing, you know, hospitalization in some cases when dogs even eat small quantities of high-fat barbecue, pizza, what have you, can end up quite sick from that. Um, but so just because the dog likes something, A, doesn't mean necessarily it's the best 
health wise and b it may not be the best ethically and when you consider what goes on in factory farms the cruelty that chickens pigs and other farmed animals go through to become meat it certainly is something that's worthy of our consideration and our moral concern yes I certainly don't want to contribute to the suffering of those animals unnecessarily and since dogs can be healthfully maintained on a nutritionally balanced and complete vegan diet I think it's it's perfectly appropriate to do so you know again provided that the diet is nutritionally balanced okay. now there are certain breeds of dogs that may have particular issues that can come up uh, whether they're on a meat or a vegan based diet and uh, the, that has to do with urinary crystal formation with the pH becoming too alkaline uh-huh. And so there, those breeds are miniature poodles, uh, miniature schnauzers, cocker spaniels, bichon, frisés, lhasa apsas, and shih tzus. So if someone has one of those breeds and they wanted to switch them to a vegan diet, I would exercise a little bit of more caution, perhaps get some urine testing done and ensure adequate water intake in the diet because in those cases, in those particular breeds, they are predisposed to the pH becoming too alkaline, which can lead to crystals, struvite crystals forming in the urine. And wow. if they don't get uh, adjusted or, you know, eliminated through acidifying the urine in some cases, then it, it can become a more serious issue. In some cases, stones form and they have to be surgically removed, which we don't yeah. want to have that happen. And now, like I said earlier, it happens to those breeds, even if they're on a meat-based diet a lot of times, the ones that mm-hmm. are prone to it. But I mean, as long as those kinds of issues are dealt with and, you know, prevented appropriately through the right type of testing, then it it can be a very healthy diet. And most breeds don't have those issues. And the mixed breeds are the the healthiest, really, because they have the genetic diversity. Right, right. You know, know, my best dog, I I hear another dog that's so cute that we have dogs on the show. So are there any... Medical considerations are there? I mean, are there certain medical conditions, or that just we shouldn't try to make a dog become vegan if he already isn't vegan? Because one of the questions I get is because so many of us in the movement, instead of getting puppies and purebreds, we go to the shelter. We don't know how old they are. We don't know their history. And like, can you just take an eight-year-old dog and just say, "Here, the dog," you know? Well, you have to do it gradually if you're going to do it, because mm-hmm. for one thing, you don't want to rush them into a new food without a, an appropriate transition period because that can increase the chances of diarrhea, vomiting, uh, just inappetence, weight loss. So it, it should be done over the course of about a week or two, just gradually increasing the proportion of the new food and mixing it in, sometimes adding a little gravy or nutritional yeast, warming the food up to get the aromas to come out, uh, sometimes even fasting a dog for a day can stimulate the appetite enough to make him more likely to eat the food. I'm not suggesting doing anything uh, extreme, but dogs sometimes are more likely to try something new or different if they are hungry or so. That's, you know, one thing that could be tried. I wouldn't do that with cats, however, because cats, if they go more than a day or so without food, in some cases more than that, they can develop a fatty liver disease, which is quite severe and can involve hospitalization, but in dogs they're uh, more flexible, you could say, and as long as it's done gradually, most dogs will adapt to the new food. Now, there are some dogs that are extremely picky, Yes. more more of an issue with cats, but uh, certainly some of those dogs also will be that way, and it you know may require even more patience, maybe over the period of a month or two even in some cases to to really get them to switch over. Um, but, you know, I think you just do the best you can, and I'm certainly not advocating cruelty or starvation or anything extreme. Uh, I'm, you know, I think that it certainly is doable in most cases, but you know, it's it's not like we have to all be held to that ultimate standard. It's, it's just something to strive towards if it's feasible, and, you know, it's not going to always be feasible in every scenario. 
you know, we get this question a lot with kids, you know, because I work on not only having people eat a plant-based diet, but eating a whole food plant-based diet, a healthy version of one. And I, I have private clients or just people in general that like, you know, they raise their kids eating a lot of junk food and now they have a hard time getting to eat healthy. Do you think though it is easier to do this if you get the dog as a puppy than if you have an older dog? I mean, are they like humans in that their taste kind of gets set and they kind of, you know, don't like change so much? You know, that's an interesting question. I haven't noticed a difference that way, uh, but I would recommend rescuing a dog or cat uh-huh. rather than getting as a puppy, you know, from a breeder because there's so many animals that are in need of homes, and unfortunately oh. a lot of them are not allowed to live because of not enough homes for them all, which is really sure. sad. That's, 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 my, that's always been my number one cause even before vegan, well, not before, but that, that, mm-hmm. that please spay and neuter, don't breed and buy while homeless yeah. animals die. I can't, I just, yeah. that breaks my heart more than anything that just in LA alone, a thousand dogs and cats are put to death every week and the national figures yeah. are much more staggering. And if I had one wish, that would be my wish that, that, mm-hmm. that every pet gets a home and we don't need to keep making more when there's right. so many out there that are just wonderful and and that makes me really sad so so you mentioned cats and we've been talking about tonight's book which is about healthy happy pooch but now I don't I've never had a cat I love cats but I just hadn't had the pleasure to have one because I always remember the saying that you know dogs have guardians cats have staff and I don't yeah. really like you know waiting on anyone but but now cats are naturally carnivores is that not they true? are they're obligate carnivores so it's definitely not something to launch into without carefully looking into the, the facts surrounding making cats vegan. Now, some cats will adapt to a vegan diet more readily than others, and, and some cats are just extremely finicky, and if they don't eat enough and they lose weight or they start developing fatty liver disease, then it's really bad news. So it's not for every single cat. Right. But there are some cats that are more amenable to changing their food around, um, Mine happen to be pretty flexible. Right? So they've, they've been healthy on a vegan diet for wow. several years. But they, since they are um, in need of certain amino acids like taurine, it's essential that that be added in. Uh-huh. There are a few dog breeds that also benefit from taurine uh, being added to the food. And I think if someone is going to do a home-cooked diet, they should definitely add the appropriate supplements to make sure those trace nutrients are accounted for. If not, they can add a small portion of a commercially available pet, uh, either a dog or cat food, as the case may be. But cool. there are certain brands of nutritionally complete vegan cat food, such as Evolution and OmniCat, that uh, do offer the full nutrient profile that cats require. And it's you know it's important to do the transition gradually. And if someone has a male cat, it's particularly important that the urine be checked because if they do develop those struvite crystals, which can happen if the pH of the urine becomes too alkaline, that can actually be a very severe emergency situation uh, where they have to be unblocked, where they are not able to urinate, and that is also expensive. So we definitely don't want that to happen, and I don't mean to scare people, but I just want to make sure people are aware of the potential consequences if you know they don't monitor them closely. Uh, females don't typically get blocked. So even with a female, however, there is a potential for urinary stones to form over time. So if they notice the cat has discomfort while using the litter box or anything like that, it certainly would be advisable to get a urine sample checked. And just as part of a general health check, you know, when you take your animal to the vet, it's a good idea to get a blood sample and a urine test anyway. So nothing out of the ordinary realm of diagnostic tests that are offered at you know most vet clinics so you know i i, I interviewed uh, last year dr jay gordon the plant-based pediatrician and one mm-hmm. of the areas we discussed for humans was vaccinations because you know he at least believes that that humans should have the choice that that, that yeah, you know whether yeah. or not they how do you feel in i mean should we do all the stuff our vet says and get all the i mean at rabies you have to get right it's the law Rabies vaccines are required by law. Um, the other ones should be, depending on which ones we're referring to, I mean, for dogs, parvo and distemper are important as puppies and then boostering as adults. And then after that, you can do a titer test, which is a blood level of the antibodies. There are other vaccines that may be recommended if dogs encounter other dogs a lot, uh, Portatella is for kennel cough. 
but you know I think too much vaccination is not a good thing and there are certainly are reports of autoimmune diseases and other allergy type issues related to over vaccination mm -hmm. but I also want to mention that with humans uh, we, we have a law that just passed in California unfortunately called SB 277 which mandates kids to be vaccinated in order to go to school by the full CDC schedule of vaccines and oh my. it's been shown that uh, there's been severe corruption at the CDC regarding the link between vaccines containing mercury and autism, which was actually suppressed for over a decade. Oh, and uh, senior scientist Bill Thompson is wanting to be subpoenaed by Congress so he can disclose this because he has a guilty conscience over <laughs> his role in covering up the link between autism and vaccines. And now this law, SB 277, which goes into effect next summer, which actually requires kids to get the full series of vaccines, which include a vaccine that's given on their first day of life, hepatitis nice. C, for an STD, which there's no reason to give. Oh, my. Uh, and and the, the the evidence of harm from vaccines continues to mount, and yet these parents are just being forced to give their kids vaccines, oh, whether they agree with it or not. So there's yeah. actually an effort right now to repeal this unjust law through a referendum process, which I've oh, been uh, trying to raise awareness about and there's a website sb277referendum.com which people can check out and also a really great documentary called Trace Amounts which talks about how mercury not just from vaccines but also mercury fillings and other sources in the environment fish can be a definite um, indicator in the development of neurological problems including autism. Oh boy thank you for sharing that. So you do strictly house calls now is that correct? Primarily house calls. I do have access to a clinic where I can do surgeries, phase neuters, master mobiles, dentals, also radiographs as needed, you know, x-rays for you know, orthopedic or other issues that may come up. I can do those at the clinic in West LA. And yeah, with regard to my house call practice, I offer routine exams, blood work, vaccines, also acupuncture and I will be doing chiropractic very shortly. Oh, how nice. That's great. Yeah. I, that, so so, so you're like a mobile vet, in other words. That's right. And do you have, because I'd love you to tell our listeners, I mean, not all of them are from California, but what area you service and how they could get in touch with you for your services. Sure. My website is veganvet.net, and you can email me through my website. My uh, email address is also veganvet at gmail.com, so either of those will get to me. And I service West Los Angeles, Marina del Rey, Venice, Mar Vista, Santa Monica, Culver City, also Brentwood, and certain parts of uh, the east side, uh, not too far east of the 405-10 interchange, but I can go up to Malibu, Pacific Palisades, and on occasion I'll go further depending on the situation. I, I you know, try to keep it a somewhat reasonable radius, you know, based on the amount of uh, traveling I have to do. But, you know, sometimes I'll do phone consultations or email Mm -hmm. It just depends on the situation. So no San Fernando Valley then, huh? I do make some valley calls probably once or twice a month. Mm -hmm. So, it, yeah, I, I could do that. It's just a little bit more expensive for I the valley compared to I understand. Do you, I'm just curious, do you have a lot of pets yourself or you're just too busy? I have two cats, both rescued, Sally and Betty, and they're both on a vegan diet. Oh, how cool. How cool. No, how yeah. come no dogs? Because you're, you're not home enough? Well, you know, I would love to have a dog. I would probably adopt one. I grew up with dogs and cats and I've mm -hmm. had them most of my life. But uh, right now I have an apartment, so I don't have a yard, but I, I would like to get a house one of these days and, and one with a yard. And then once I have a yard, I would definitely want to adopt a dog. Um, you know, it's funny. I, I don't know if you know this about me, Dr. May, but that's what I wanted to be from when I was a little kid was a vet. And I wow. went to the university. Well, this is how I became a vegan because I couldn't be a vet. I went to the <laughs> University of Pennsylvania when I was 17. That was my dream to be a veterinarian. And I always joke because instead I became a vegetarian because I worked for a vet and they were ha requiring me to do vivisection. And I did it one time mm -hmm. and I, I could never do it again. So instead I became yeah. a, a, a veterinarian. When did you decide you wanted to be a veterinarian and why? I knew I wanted to be a veterinarian from a very young age. I always had a, a natural kinship for animals. And luckily, thanks to my mom, I was raised pretty much vegetarian from birth, uh, other than just small amounts of fish. But I was lacto ovo vegetarian growing up. And then I went vegan when I learned about the dairy and egg industries, reading Diet mm -hmm. for New America by John Robbins, which really opened my eyes 
And so I've been vegan since I was 18, and I've never looked back. And when I learned more about what happens to animals raised for food, it really stimulated my desire to be an advocate for them on a you know broad scope, not just helping individual patients, which is also rewarding and satisfying in its own right. Mm-hmm. But I, I find that um, being a spokesperson for the animals who don't have a voice is something that really gives me meaning and purpose, and, and that's what makes me happy (laughs) well you're a great public speaker i mean you're in toastmasters you're really good too you're very articulate so i thank you for being that voice you mentioned you always had a kinship with animals have you ever read the book kinship for all life or all creatures great and small i have those books at home i i know i've i've read some of those stories Yeah, those those are some of the reasons i actually wanted to be veterinarian do you think you'll ever write a book because i would love to hear what you have to say you know i am thinking about it i i do have some ideas kind of floating around so you know one of these days yeah, I'm, <laughs> don't I'm hold sure. your breath but I think I... hello uh oh spaghettios come back come back I have more questions that I don't know her phone number this is one guest that Dr. May can you hear me oh this is so frustrating hmm Sanai are you still there yes I'm here do you know our mighty's number? So I, I I can't hear her anymore. Shoot, we may have to. Uh, have phone number. Up. Wait, are you back? Yeah, oh, I just here, back. Here, my here. phone disconnected. Um, thank you, Doctor May. I don't have your number, so I just was. I'm so glad you came back. Oh yeah. Oh boy, good, 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 good for thank you so much. Well, we we're almost done, but I I actually did have a few more questions, and one of them is just kind of well I. Maybe it's not a fun question, but to me it's fun. You know, um, they had in recent years they started offering this DNA testing for for dogs. You know, Uh and I wanted to know because I had it done because I always rescue mutts. Is it real? Because I I, is it real? Do they just sit around a table smoking and say, well, let's make this dog be this? Because for one of my dogs, it was spot on because we knew what she was, but for the other one, it made no sense whatsoever. You know, I've had cases where those tests have showed really strange results mm-hmm. and other cases where they you know, seemed more reasonable or predictable. So I don't know exactly how they conduct those tests, but I, I've also had my suspicions about the accuracy. So mm-hmm. who knows? I, I don't really delve too much into that because to me a dog is a dog and I don't like think that there's something that extraordinary about this breed or that breed. I mean, they're all special in their own ways, of course, and certainly there are some very exquisite mutts out there, you know, different hybrids that are are very uh, well adapted. But I I think it's at the end of the day, they're all kind of the same to me. So, you know, I love mutts too. Why are dogs so awesome? I mean, animals in general, but there's just something about dogs. Why, why, Why do they have, why are they so awesome? They are so loyal. They they just have like an unconditional love and the ability to forgive, which is something that I think a lot of people could do well to learn from. And sure. it's like when someone's down and feeling lonely, they can reach out to their dog and the dog is always there for them. And it's like, it's such a beautiful, pure love that they have for their guardians. And yeah, it's really inspiring. Yep, I love them. And um, how do you feel about like dogs, like helping people in hospitals and stuff like that, if, like therapy dogs and service dogs? It's awesome. I have a friend who's also vegan, and she's a dog trainer, and she has a therapy dog, a little Chihuahua named Boris. Mm-hmm. And she goes to Cedars once a week with him, and he cheers up the patients that have cancer. And I mean, just yeah. having them like sit in their laps is sure. so therapeutic and soothing. And yeah, he's he's a really delightful little guy. You know, I I I just uh, filmed seven more episodes of my TV show Healthy Living with Chef AJ, and one of my guests was a cardiologist from Michigan named Dr. Joel Kahn. And he and one of the things he was saying is that having a dog just improves your cardiovascular health as a human just exponentially. It's just it's just amazing the research on that. Yeah, definitely. So it you know it's a healthy thing for the person, and of course saving a life is great for that dog to have a loving home so it's just a win-win yeah yeah so is there anything else our listeners should know about just so that they can have a healthy dog a healthy cat any just just you know go to what do you go is it like going to the dentist you just go to your vet twice a year whether you need to or not you know it's, it's important to have regular checkups to do an overall health check 
dogs that are growing, you know, it's important to make sure they have the appropriate nutrition. Certain large breeds shouldn't be overfed because that can actually lead to certain bony problems with uh, joint abnormalities, um, but they, they need to be adequately fed. But there are a lot of dogs nowadays, and you mentioned this earlier, who are obese uh, in, in our part of the world anyway. Of course, there are other parts of the world where there are dogs that are emaciated, and certainly both of those problems are, are needing to be addressed. But, you know, the appropriate nutrition that meets their caloric needs and, of course, appropriate exercise. I mean, just like we need mm-hmm. exercise, you know, they certainly need that too and and that social interaction um it you know it's a combination of things and being aware of the environment the air the water you know things that you know may seem obvious but that's also affecting our genes and our health outcomes just as food is there's certain things in our homes that may not be the healthiest certain toxic chemicals that go into couches and beds and mattresses and so forth i've invested to get organic mattresses because I don't want to have those toxic flame retardant chemicals seeping into my air that I breathe or that my cats breathe and rub up against and so forth. So those types of things I think definitely do make a difference and it's like making an investment in your health. You know, it's a little expensive in the beginning, but then you figure, well, if I can avoid certain negative health outcomes, this is worthwhile. Well, you mentioned exercise, regular exercise, but like, how do you mm-hmm. know how much? Because at least now with my new dog, I mean, actually all my dogs, they see a leash, they want to go. I mean, they, they would like walk all day. I mean, what's the appropriate amount of exercise? I actually put a pedometer on my dog. Is like 10,000 steps right for her too? Because I, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, that's a good question. I think overdoing it can be harmful if they're prone to arthritis or other, you know, joint problems or, or too sudden a, a jolt. Dogs that do a lot of uh, sudden activity after being sedentary for a long time can injure themselves and, and develop uh, ligament tears. But just moderate, just like, you know, if someone has been sitting around for a, a long time and then decides to jump into activity, it should be done gradually. So it kind of depends on the guardian's activity level because, that has to be somewhat matched to the dog's activity level in terms of just the practicality of it. But, you know, some people like to run with their dogs on the beach where the mm-hmm. dog's beach is allowed, dogs, that is, but, you know, or go on hikes or whatnot. And other people, they may just walk around the blocks they live nearby for, you know, a couple minutes, 10, 15 minutes, twice a day. Mm-hmm. The dog is older and maybe having some arthritis going on. Maybe it's going to be a shorter walk. Maybe it's just going to be seven minutes twice a day or even around the block once they get to be kind of slower. So the vet can help tailor the exercise plan according to the dog's age and activity level. But, yeah, it's it's important to do it gradually, especially if the dog's been very sedentary for a long period. They sure they sure do love going for walks, I'll tell you that. Oh, yeah. So So last question, you know, human beings are living longer but not necessarily healthier. But in my 55 years, it doesn't seem like the longevity of dogs has really increased. Why do they have to die so young, and is there mm-hmm. anything we can do so that they can live, you know, 50 or 60 years? <laughs> 50 or 60 years, I don't think that's going to happen. <laughs> not not realistic. I, the oldest, the longest lived dog I've heard of was 27 and I think was somewhat like a border collie and was on a vegan diet that was composed of lentils and rice. Wow. And in my own practice, I've seen a dog live to be about 20. That was probably around the oldest. Wow. So I would say, again, proper nutrition, proper water, good air, you know, if you need air filters, that that's a good thing for us too, to, you know, filter out the toxins, obviously don't smoke around your dog, secondhand smoke. Well, don't smoke anywhere, not even around your dog, don't be Don't smoke, period, I'm just, yeah, definitely. (laughs) Uh, Provide adequate happiness too, I think uh, one of the studies looking into bloat and what causes bloat, which is a condition where a dog's stomach expands suddenly and twists, and then it, it's a life-threatening condition where they have to be rushed to the hospital and have emergency surgery sometimes if it, if it twists on itself. But one of the things that can prevent that is having a happy dog, they found out. Mm-hmm. So giving your dog love and affection, you know, all those things do make a difference. Sure. You know, we're holistic organisms. <laughs> 
You know, people love dogs so much, and cats too, and they, if they could only learn to extend their circle of compassion to the animals that they see as food the way they, you know, the way we feel about our dogs. Mm-hmm. You know, because in, Chi- in China, they would eat our dogs. Right. Well, it, it really gives us reason to reflect because if they're eating dogs there and we're eating cows and pigs, well, I'm a vegan and you are vegan, but, you know, so many others are eating pigs, chickens, and cows yeah. who are just as intelligent. Especially right. pigs that are, you know, just as intelligent as a three year old child. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's probably a lot better animals probably a lot do, better behaved than a three year old child too, you know. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Well I could talk to you guys all day. This has just been such a really fun call because I always I, I'm gonna probably be cremated, but I always said that if I was gonna, you know, sit in a cemetery somewhere for perpetuity and have a headstone I'd always wanted to say that she never met a dog or a dessert she didn't like and so it was just <laughs> a pleasure talking to you wonderful ladies about my favorite subject which is dogs and then you know veganism is my other favorite subject so thank you so much to Sanai Suzuki the author of healthy happy pooch where you can learn how to make not only your own dog food but all kinds of household cleaners and to the vegan vet Dr. Armighty May so thank you ladies so much for being on the show and thank you all. It was great talking to you. And thank you all for listening to Healthy Living. I'm Chef AJ, and I make healthy taste delicious. Good night, everyone, and thank you. Thank you. Bye, thank guys. Thank you.